warm welcome to um, our event this afternoon. Uh, my name is Lynn Corner. I'm uh, the Deputy Director of the UK's National Innovation Centre for Ageing. This is our beautiful Catalyst building and it's lovely to see so many of you here. Um, I'm also the Director of VOICE. Uh, VOICE stands for Valuing Our Intellectual Capital and Experience, which is a bit of a mouthful. But fundamentally, it's about valuing people like yourselves, valuing your experience, the knowledge, the ideas, the wisdom that we collect um, through our lifetime um, in our all of our alumni, but also in our communities, our, our jobs, our families. And uh, we have an organization here that's 15 years old. And if you haven't already joined Voice or you'd like to have some more information, please do, because we would love to hear from you. We operate across the UK and internationally, and um, we would people like yourselves are at the heart of what we do, learning a little bit about what we're doing in terms of research and innovation to help people live he healthier, happier, longer lives. Now, talking of healthier, happier, longer lives, in the week of International Women's Day, the issue of menopause has just been so important. Um, we know that it's one of the areas that um, has great stigma attached to it, but there's also so much that women can learn from the experience of menopause. And I'm delighted that we have an expert, Karen Ross, um, who is going to talk to you a little bit um, about this subject and of her research on it. So welcome, Karen, and look forward to your talk. Thanks, Lynn. Um, uh, that's that's lovely you telling saying that I'm an expert. I'm not actually an expert on menopause, other than having gone through it and at the other side and actually feeling you know very very cool about it. But I suppose I am an expert in terms of the research um, the research agenda. So I'm just I'm a, I'm going to talk for about thirty five minutes, and I'm just going to get my phone um, starting. So. At 35 minutes, my phone will start clucking or barking or doing whatever the ringtone is to remind me that I have five minutes. And I also got someone who's going to be giving me the prompts. Um, so, yes, I would also like to extend a welcome to everyone who's here on a Saturday in the afternoon. Fortunately, better today than yesterday. Uh, yeah, I was very concerned with the, the snow, but you know, we're in the northeast. What, what can we expect? So. I want to just say something about the kind of context in which I started doing this work. And I put personal experience there because I'm a twin. And me and my twin, Elizabeth, we talk about everything all the time. Um, and what I realized in 2019, I think, when, she, when I started thinking about doing a project, is we'd never actually talked about our menopause experience. And then when I thought about the fact that we hadn't done that and we did start talking about it, we realised that we had really, really different experiences, despite being twins. And I thought to myself, this would be a really interesting project because I don't really I don't know anything really about other women's experience of menopause and just thought, if I don't know about these things and had no kind of points of reference because I didn't really talk to anyone, um, when I was going through the menopause, maybe maybe it would be a useful thing to do to actually find out about other women's experiences. So I started thinking about framing a project which would actually start looking at women's experiences. And also over the last, since I've been at Newcastle, which I think is about six years now, I've done quite a few projects which have been focused on finding our voice in terms of older women. So I've done flash mobs in Granger Market. I've done pop-up choirs at the Monument. And it's always been about trying to find ways to encourage older women to be visible and actually to, you know, to, to speak their, their truth to power, to, to use that phrase. So I've been quite keen on doing that over the last few years. And this seemed to me to be something, uh, something else, a kind of development of that, of that kind of research. But, you know, menopause is, we think about it now, I think that lots of people now think about menopause now in 2023 as being a relatively kind of new thing. I mean, it's, it's certainly new in terms of the news agenda, but it clearly is not new for, you know, 50% of women who experience it, you know, from, from dot. So it is very old news, but as we know, in terms of news, news really doesn't tend to have much in, in terms of a history. So every time, you know, there's a Davina McCall documentary or there's an HRT czar or whatever it is. It's like, oh, menopause, you know, as if it's suddenly kind of sprung, you know, fully formed from, from, from nowhere. So again, you know, as far as 
as I was con concerned, this was another reason to try and kind of put it on the agenda, at least in terms of the research agenda. And there is this idea of menopause magic, it, which is what I'm term terming it, terming it. So you have, as soon as you have a celebrity involvement, Davina McCall, McCall being a really good example, again, it, it's like, right, so that's what we need in order for people, you know, government, for the news to actually think about menopause as something um, worth while talking about. So you have things like the Davina effect with her two doc documentaries, which you have, if you haven't watched them there, I would encourage you if you want to know a bit more about menopause, they're quite interesting. They're not, you know, they all, all, all kind of media artifacts have, you know, pluses and minuses. But one of the things that she did, Davina McColl did, was actually generate some actual, some more kind of media interest and it actually spawned a, a particular website. And then you had, oops, sorry. And then you had, oh, why wasn't that working? Okay, it's not working. Uh, maybe you can just read, you probably can read it. It's kind of pale gray. Carolyn Harris's uh, private members bill. So that kind of came out um, in 2021. And again, that prompted another, that prompted government to actually start thinking about it. On the back of that, as you may recall, for those of you who kind of kind of follow the news, there was a kind of big um, issue about the the lack of HRT, and that then prompted the initiation of an HRT czar. The, the government is actually there's a slightly they, they're now doing something different. Um, they don't have a HRT czar. Uh, they're going to have an H. They're going to have a menopause ambassador, which for me is is a much better framing because menopause is not just about HRT. Um, and then you've got monetizing menopause and which isn't to say that, you know, we shouldn't have products which actually help menopausal women, but sometimes you have a product like a moisturizer or a shampoo, which suddenly says, hey, and this is appropriate for menopausal women. And it's like five times more expensive than your, your ordinary shampoo or, or um, moisturizer. And it's not entirely clear how that's how it's different. Well, I would suggest it probably isn't different. So this is um, the website that uh, the well the the website platform, uh, the menopause charity. And again, so I've just kind of indicated with that kind of yellow um, arrow. I'm really keen that we don't simply see menopause as a kind of medical condition. That actually it's. It's a normal part of you know every woman's life and actually lots of women can't take hrt it's not appropriate so the more that we can kind of think about menopause more holistically it would be um helpful oh i see okay should have tra should have tra tracked this uh, back so caroline uh, actually well, well i won't uh, well i will actually talk about oh yeah okay so one of the things that carolyn harris did um, I don't know if you, you've seen her in action, but she's a very um, she's a very uh, bubbly um, woman who really likes to make a bit of a splash. And she did this. Uh, she ha had this um, event uh, in the House of Parliament um, where she made a number of of men, including these two, uh, Wes Sweeting and um, Ian Duncan Smith, wear a hot vest. And I just think hopefully I can make this. Well, Welcome to our one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, that. Okay, so some of you hopefully will have seen the um, the exhibition that's actually just on in the foyer, um, and the exhibition artifacts were actually produced by women um, in the in the, the research project. In terms of thinking about the the rationale, so as I'm saying here, it was very much my view was having having done a number of participatory projects with older women um, in the past, I wanted this to be something which was, you know, co owned by uh, the women who took part. And so it was very much about, you know, sharing, learn, learning and, and affirming and affirming their experiences. Hi. Um, I was also kind of quite keen that, you know, it's it's a really personal experience and lots of women who are, you know, who are going through the menopause don't really talk about it. And here I was trying to gather groups of women in workshop situations and asking them to talk about this really personal experience. And I thought that if they were busy doing something, crafting something, that actually might make for a, a less, um, a, a more encouraging, a more kind of sympathetic and uh, enjoyable environment. And it absolutely did. It worked really well. And I worked with um, two arts therapists um, who work with Equal Arts. So some of you might know Equal Arts, kind of local charity that, that, that works generally with older people. And they were just really brilliant in, you know, they did different things, um, but really encouraged women to both kind of talk about, you know, their experiences, but also to develop or to kind of, you know, write the menopause or craft the menopause. Originally, I thought that we might be able to knit the menopause, but in the end, that that kind of didn't work. Um, but we did actually do some kind of collage and some other things, as you can see from the uh, the artifacts which are outside. So we organised. I organised three workshops in uh, in Newcastle, and a colleague organised two workshops in Makerere in Uganda. So I was interested to see whether or not there, there were kind of cultural differences in terms of women's experiences particularly in terms of how people respond to them as women, not simply about the, the women's own experiences, but how other people kind of reacted to their, their, men, their menopause and menopausal sim symptoms. So it was very much about trying to kind of create this safe space. And after the workshops, I just got some really great feedback from, from women who'd participated, who really had said, this was the first time I really talked about it. And what was really amazing actually in the workshops themselves is that some women got really incredibly emotional particularly when they were thinking about how other people had reacted to them and there was a couple of women who had felt that they were working in such a hostile environment that they actually took early retirement in two different workshops and the women who were sitting around them they just kind of crowded around and just hugged them and yeah, it was, there's something about that women's space, even when you have women who don't know them, know each other, and that it actually just creates that environment where people can really talk about really personal things, but in a, you know, in a way that actually values what their own experience and actually enables other people to say, oh my God, yeah, I, it was like that for me as well. And the other really interesting thing I think about the workshops is that they had that there was a mix of women at different points in their menopausal journey so there are a couple of women who are perimenopausal there are a few women who are postmenopausal and the perimenopausal women it was really it was useful them for them to hear that there is you know a there's light at the end of the tunnel and not only there's that there's light at the end of the tunnel but actually you continue your journey that actually menopause isn't this this full stop beyond which you then shrivel up and die there is actually all sorts of lovely things which happen on the other side of menopause as, as, as you're here so I think that was just that's such an affirming message for particularly for perimenopausal women who really don't know what to expect and to hear that to hear the kind of variety of of experiences both during menopause and post-menopause I think was actually really um helpful When I started thinking about this project, it was in 2019, and I had organized a series of workshops which were going to start in March 2020, and then obviously COVID happened, so that that didn't happen. So that was the, the project was paused for uh, well, for kind of 18 months until 
such time as we actually felt able to, you know, be in person again. But what that meant is that I lost quite a, a few women along the way who really then didn't feel that they wanted to, to, to be in close uh, contact with people, which was when I then had thought, well, OK, well, maybe I can try and do this kind of cross-cultural uh, study, which, which I did do. And I worked with one of the things I really I was really keen to come out of this particular project was something other than simply a research paper. I wanted actually something which we could use in training to train frontline staff, health workers, but particularly to train our own students here at, at, the, at the university. So I had found I'd, I'd, I'd advertised there's a particular Facebook group locally in Newcastle for creatives, and I'd put up the little kind of job spec um, for an animator to work with me on this project. And the, the person who I e eventually kind of worked with, Cheryl Jenkins, just this really brilliant woman who came along. I really liked her work. Um, she came along to all the workshops. She kind of took loads of notes, did lots of photos and um, photographed all the artifacts that, that came out of the workshops. And then you'll see bit, bits of her animation. So together we kind of produced, well, we had some ideas about what that animation should include, but she was she basically made the animation. It's about 18 minutes. And it's currently doing the rounds of film festivals. And I really hope that we get something, that she gets something really great out of it. Because it's a, it's a really, I think kind of like both challenging, but also uplifting um, piece of work. And because it's an animation, I think animation works particularly well in awareness raising and training because it's quite a it's quite a gentle medium. So you can get across quite good, you know, sort of solid messages, but without bashing people over their head with their with their ignorance or their, their various isms that they might have. So the kind of key outputs from the project were the animation and the exhibition, which is being which you've seen in, in the in the foyer. So this is the third time that the exhibition has been up. Um, it's now going, it's now getting a little bit warm around the edges. Um, but we had a private view for the participants um, in it was in the long gallery last year. And at the depending on how much time we've got, at the very end of this presentation, there's a like three minute segment of the of how women actually responded because it was the first time that everyone anyone in the workshops had actually seen the animation and it was just a really lovely um lovely event so we ask we ask kind of these general questions to start with about what what menopause meant for meant to women and to ask them to kind of just write you know, just to write stuff, you know, to kind of mind map what, what it really, what it meant, what the themes were. So one of the kind of things that came out was this idea of not knowing what to expect, you know, particularly in the kind of perimenopausal um, phase. And someone had said, well, of course, I didn't even know that there was such a thing as perimenopause. You know, when I had my menopause, it was just like, I just suddenly entered, you know, I suddenly stopped having periods or I got hot, hot flushes or I started experiencing menopausal symptoms, but I didn't know that there was this pre, this pre period called perimenopause. Um, and I think actually, again, that was because we don't talk about it and we don't really know about what to expect. And it also, what became really clear for women who were either perimenopause or, or at the beginning of their kind of menopause journey, is that they were experiencing symptoms which they simply didn't associate with being perimenopausal or menopausal because they didn't, you know, when we think about menopause, if, you know, particularly if you haven't been through it, you think about hot flushes and sweating. You don't really think about anything else, but there are like a gazillion, unfortunately, other kind of problems, issues, symptoms associated with menopause. And if we actually had a better understanding of that range, we might then, when we go to our GP, might be able to challenge back when the GP says, I think you're just depressed, I'll just prescribe some Valium or I'll just prescribe some anti antidepressants. So if we have more knowledge, I think that we could actually challenge GPs in the way that we will challenge GPs about other things, you know, you go to the GP and you say, I've just been, you know, I've been doing, I've been seeing Dr. Google and I think I've got, you know, whatever it is. So if we can actually do some, a bit more of that in terms of the menopause, we might actually get 
treatment, which is other than um, yeah, antidepressants. What was quite surprising to me as someone who actually had very few symptoms was the range of, of experiences, the range of symptoms that women kind of talked about. Um, and I think that this, this idea of brain fog, of feeling isolated, of you know, not knowing where your head is, what you're going to say next, those things, they, again, for me, the, because so many women actually talked about those, those particular experiences, it just it, it kind of made me realize that again, even, even me doing this piece of work, how little I actually know about you know, the, the variety um, of experiences and symptoms of menopause. And you know, what women continually said is I didn't, you know, I didn't, I wasn't prepared for this. I didn't know, I do know now, but I didn't know that that was a menopausal symptoms. And there were also these kind of these the cultural issues which kind of came out in terms of different kind of different kinds of stigma uh, in different kinds of communities. My symptoms were quite prominent. I mean, it, it definitely disrupted the quality of my sleep. I assumed it would be straightforward. I was absolutely shocked when I experienced the debilitating symptoms of perimenopause through to menopause. It also affected my mood and, you know, levels of concentration. Yeah, you'll walk yeah. into the kitchen and think, what did I go for? And you just can't think of the next word that's going to come out of your mouth. It hit me like a bag of hammers. But it made us feel really old. And you just think you've gone suddenly from your womanhood to the other side of it, where is it all shriveling up and, you know, going downhill a little bit. My decision to take early retirement was because of what I was going through. I couldn't concentrate, um, I was making mistakes, I couldn't send emails properly. It was just absolutely awful and I was also becoming anxious and rather depressed as well. I used to have to underarm hair, like, oh, loads, but now I look and I think there's anything there. Unless it's just me, I say that. And the hot sweats were really difficult to deal with until the GP put me on HRT. So, you know, overall, it was a fairly kind of traumatic time. I'm talking more kind of generally about their symptoms, but a number of women of kind of working age were talking about how, what it was like to experience menopause in the workplace. And I think that, you know, certainly in the, in this kind of context, um, and certainly at the university, it is something that we are now really taking you know embracing in terms of thinking about how we can actually support women um, who are going through the menopause and as you may or may not know the government's women equalities committee had put put forward I think three weeks ago 12 point plan including developing uh, policy around menopause within the within the workplace government well actually I should maybe I shouldn't well in the context of Gary Lineker um, government has decided not to go that route, uh, has decided not to um, encourage employers to, to develop a menopause policy um, and have also decided not to go with, again, the Women Equalities Committee, their own Women and Equalities Committee, I should say, um, to make menopause a protected characteristic. And I think that there are kind of there's a minus is to doing that, but to just basically say that they're not even going to consider it, I think is says something about their commitment um, to women's health at the same time as actually developing last year the first women's health strategy that, that has ever come from government. So it seems to me that there are certain contradictions uh, in terms of what government says and what it's actually going to do. But generally, most women really felt unsupported uh, by the um, by the Im immediate kind of culture and often by their managers, not only male managers, women, female managers as, as well. Um, and in fact, I mean, interestingly, as, as we'll see, I mean, when women kind of talked about the response to going to see a GP, they felt that they would often say the most sympathetic hearing they got was from a male GP whose wife was going through the menopause because you know they lived it every day and actually got much more sympathy than uh, than than young women who obviously hadn't got to that point. Um, 
and I think that this 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 last point at the end is something uh, with one of the women who made this point, who's actually a lecturer, and she was kind of talking about, you know, on the one hand, you can you can have you know flexible working, which were, which is really kind of helpful um, for people, but if you're actually standing in the lecture theatre and you're you just lose it, it actually flexible working is not that helpful because it's like how do you actually how do you how do you deal with that when you're there with a classroom full of students? So, you know, there are there, there are ways in which we can kind of think about that. And what she said is that she would just, as soon as she realised what was going on, she would just say, I need to have a moment. Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm a menopausal woman. I'm just going to have a moment. I'll come back to you in a minute. So, and I think it's actually having the confidence to be able to say that um, in that context. I think that's where we need to be kind of moving moving towards. The other kind of key issue that kind of women talked about was other people's attitudes, societal attitudes towards the menopausal woman or the kind of menopause and all the, you know, all the kind of euphemisms of, you know, going through the change or the sniggering behind the hands or I just re remember, I mean, because of that, I'm that kind of age, you know, Les Dawson doing his, you know, his, his personations of, you know, a woman going through the change, you know, going through the change and that, you know, how how you know menopause is actually framed as something which is really negative which is really horrible and yeah it, it, it's basically it's saying okay so once you're in that frame once you're in that part of your life course then you, you, you stop actually being a kind of viable human being and you become you know you start wearing beige and knitting you know it, it's as if as if something you know there is this break um, between being a vital human being and actually being the crone um, and all the kind of connotations of the crone with the witch and the broomstick and goodness knows what else um, and this this point at the the end that is how kind of women feel society they don't that, that isn't how women feel this is how they feel society actually views them but I think that GPs came in for you know the the most criticism in terms of negative attitudes towards kind of menopausal women um, and I think there is an issue as I said about medicalizing menopause which isn't to say that for lots of women medical interventions are really helpful but actually it's not it's part of our journey and actually seeing it in a more holistic way I think is is, is helpful rather than just always having a medical label. We try to look at Menopause as taboo. We don't freely talk about them. I've been in, in meetings at work where the, the joke, if you're you, oh, you're going through the change, or you're menopause, or all this. So we're dismissing you, oh, what uh -huh. you're saying. Like you should be ashamed of it, and, yeah. and, and it's used as an insult. What's the matter with you? You're menopausal. Yeah. Yeah. This young consultant, female, said to me, you know, more than 50% of the population of the world are women, and they're all getting on with it, so you just need to... Oh, just oh, oh, I, don't, I don't think you've heard me. I haven't slept for months. <laughs> it's like, we're really getting through bedding at, at a horrendous way, and, I'm, and I can't function at work because I can't think and I can't remember. Yeah. And sometimes I'm just standing there delivering teaching, thinking, my God, I can't remember what I'm saying. <laughs> so we, we talked about you know, the things that we try. GPs and the attitudes. And then we got to talking about and what helps. And that was a really, that was a great part of, of the workshops, actually, where people were, women were kind of ex exchanging what worked for them. And, oh, you know, the sleep pillow and different things, you know, fans. And again, what was really helpful about that is that when, you know, someone would say, oh, well, you know, I've, I've got an ice pillow. And then, you know, the woman next to her would say, oh, my, oh, ice pillow. What, what's the ice pillow? And then they kind of talk about it. So that actually sharing information was really helpful. Um, and, and again, I think that it, it just demonstrated yet again, both to me and to everyone else, how little women actually know about you know what helps how little they know about the kind of the range of symptoms how little they know about the, the range of remedies um, and I think particularly in terms of alternative therapies like sage tablets or you know things like 
which uh, uh, that is things which are not about medical interventions. I think people were really surprised at the the, the range of things that that are out there. The other thing I did is to have a small fan next to my bed. So whenever I woke up, I would just, and, and I was sweating, I would switch on the fan. And then I got a second fan, so that when I go to another room, there is another fan there. It was so much because if everyone in the house would notice that I'm sweating. And so everyone and they would notice, well, that, yeah, what is happening? It's not even hot, but you're sweating. So I had to move with a fan in the TV room and sit there with my fan. I switch on. And everyone started saying, that's mummy's fan, that's mummy's fan. Fred suggested to get the magnet pebble, I think it was called, yeah. so I had a bash. So you put the magnet down your pants and the pedal bit on the front of the face goes. And every time, which I kept forgetting it was down my pants, I went up to the filing cabinet. I just stuck to the filing cabinet, but it was a proper clean, you could hear, yeah. so... And it just didn't work anyway. Some of my friends, it's definitely worked. Oh, them. has it? So maybe it's different people. I love my ice pillow. And so it's got um, ice gel in it, so whenever you lay your head down at night, you can you can turn it over so it's not on the ice side. But it just um, it just cools your neck and cools cools the sweats down quicker. I I take a nap during the day, mm -hmm. every day, mm -hmm. especially after lunch, mm -hmm. and I feel that makes me relax. Mm -hmm. I do my chores in the morning. I do a few things here and there. And after lunch, I immediately go to, to rest. I rest for about 45 minutes or an hour or an hour plus. And when I wake up, I feel relaxed, released, and I feel I can continue the evening. I love the pebble map. <laughs> and in fact, there's a, there's a the company who makes it is called Lady Care. And if you kind of Google, you know, does the pebble magnet work? I mean, mostly the kind of thing like there is absolutely zero science that that says it works. It's supposed to work on your kind of hormonal balance, yeah. But everyone just thought that, that was just hilarious. So we kind of talked about some of the remedies, and then again, the women who were there who were postmenopausal talked about actually what it was like to be on the other side, to have that as many women kind of talked about to have that kind of le that hormonal level and not to have to worry about you know all the things that you know that you worry about when you're kind of menstruating and I think that this this idea that you are, it's a, it's a, it's the calm sea after you know particularly for women who've had really you know difficult periods or lots of um, kind of hormonal imbalances or lots of mood swings actually not having any of that was just a revelation for, for, for many women and there was this sense of actually feeling empowered and partly I think that's be that is about being a, a postmenopausal woman but it's also part of being an older woman and actually not giving a damn about what other people think and actually feeling that you know, if you're no longer, you know, an object of, of kind of sexual interest, it actually enables you to do lots of other things. Um, so I mean, I think there was, but again, different women have different attitudes, you know, so one, so one relatively young woman was, was talking about how she felt when she was described as senora, as opposed to senorina, and that she suddenly thought, oh my God, I'm no longer seen as senorina. And other women would just say, oh, my God, that was so liberating. I now have to, I don't have to shave my legs. It's fantastic. Particularly when you know, they actually had lost all their leg hair. So that was also uh, quite helpful. So, I mean, I, th I suppose that, you know, the what I'd like to kind of conclude with is that doing this this work, I think for me, was really eye opening. It was kind of really great piece of work. Um, you know, this is something that, you know, one, this is obviously an art, something which a postmenopausal woman um, described. Just having a level hormonal stroke, emotional landscape, it's gone. It's gone. My mood is more stable than it used to yeah. be. I don't have the monthly mood swings or anything like that. I don't stand for anything now. If I've got something to say, I'll say it or, yeah. you know, I won't take shit anymore. Yeah. And I would say I push myself more, mm -hmm. but that's a bit about women being invisible when they hit the menopause and it's about proving that actually you're not mm -hmm. over the hill.
when you share, when we work together as women uh, or girls, we can support each other. Maybe we will be that generation of women who do see that power, you know, retaking that crone image um, from sort of popular Disney films and actually what it was really meant to be, which is the women coming into their, you know, coming into their power, into the, that kind of age where it's a sort of, I guess there's a freedom, isn't there? The impact of the project, um, it's now, the animation is now being taken up by a medical school um, and kind of be, it's going to be used in, in training of students. It's actually also going, it's part of the of Newcastle University's kind of workplace culture awareness raising. Um, I did a presentation last year on World Menopause Day in October. Um, which actually was picked up by uh, Look North, largely because the person who came to cover the event and also I commissioned really great uh, singer-songwriter, Bethany Ellen, to write a menopause song. And so we had a pop-up choir that was singing the menopause song actually in the workshop. And Look, the Look North um, journalist came along, did the kind of filming. And she was interested because she was a menopausal woman and obviously made it her business to make sure that there's a little, little spot on Look North on that day on the 18th of October. So that was really great. I then was asked to um, write it up, write the project up for Menopause Matters, which I did. And the next stage, I've just managed to get um, uh, internal funding to put on a stage play, which will actually be in here um, in July. And it kind of draws on the workshop testimonies and they're, they're, it's quite humorous. Um, so again, it's going. You know, the effort. The, the the point is to try and bring to life women's experiences in a way in, in ways which actually might prompt people to be to to be thoughtful about the kind of menopause process. So we're actually seeing rehearsals next week. So if anyone's interested um, being part of it, uh, let me know. This is this is just what, as I said, what what came out um, in January. Um, the, yeah, the government has rejected, as I'm saying here, rejected some of the, in fact, half of the proposals uh, made by its own Women and Equalities Committee. Which um, is, you just wonder why we, why government has a Women and Equalities Committee if it's going to take zero notice of their recommendations. But yeah, there we are. Uh, we have the government that some of us did or didn't vote for. But thank you very much. Thank you so much. Do you want to come over and sit down? Well, I think we all need a pebble, Magnus. <laughs> Can't wait to get mine. <laughs> so I think that was absolutely brilliant. And, um, you know, really experts by experience. And I think I was watching the audience and a lot of nods at certain points when people kind of really resonated um, with those, um, the issues that you raised, Farad. Um, such a lot that you covered in terms of the link between this issue and medicalization and the need to see it as a much more holistic agenda. You raised the issues around ageism and menopause, the workplace, just so much there. So I know there'll be loads and loads of questions, but over to you. Any questions for Karen? They're all fine, trying to think about how they're going to get the pebble magnet. <laughs> Absolutely. One over here. I'm going to get the ball um, rolling. Karen, thank you very much. That was a brilliant talk. Really interesting. Pebble magnets, my goodness. Um, so um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about why you think um, menopause leave would be a good way forward. Menopause leave, is that what you said? Yeah. Um, I think... I think menopause leave would is, again, helpful in for certain women in certain occupations. Um, I think, I mean, go government was against um, menopause leave on the grounds that it would discriminate against men, which is quite an extraordinary um, thing to say. I, I think it actually says it would discriminate against disabled men, which again is yeah, it's somewhat, somewhat of a moot point. I think if you, given that we know that there are millions of person days lost to you know, UK PLC by the fact that women feel that they have to go off sick or that they have to um, leave the workplace in, entirely because they, they don't work in a, an environment which actually enables them 
to have flexible working, I think having something like I mean, just, I have no idea how much, it would, what the take up would be for menopause leave for a start, because I think that what, I think the average, the average age in which menopause starts is 51. And some women actually start in their 20s, some women get to their late 50s. So there, there's this huge um, range of when women start. Some women, you know, they have their, their menopause is over in, you know, six months, they have hardly any symptoms. I think actually having the option, it just seems to me that menopause leave is like flexible working. If you offer it to people, depending on how it's going to be funded, then at least you can actually do some um, planning in terms of your workforce. So that seems to me to be completely sensible. The issue, I think, is that women won't know at what point, you know, that again, if they don't have any perimenopausal symptoms and they suddenly are into the menopause, what happens then? You know, I think that, so I, I just think in, in terms of teaching, that would actually be quite awkward um, to just say, right, in like now in March, actually I want to take menopause leave because I'm really suffering because we know we're only halfway through semester two. So I think it'd have to be, you know, we'd have to be quite careful, but why wouldn't we be doing that if we have parental leave or, you know, anything, anything else? So I think that, I think you just, you just have to be canny about what it is that you're suggesting, how it's going to be funded and how, you know, what the eligibility criteria is criteria will be but in principle why wouldn't you why wouldn't you have something which means that a, wo a woman will be able to return to the workplace because if you just think about a woman who's in her you know late 40s early 50s is probably has had years of, su of support from their employer if they're you know, if they've been there for a while why would this, their employer just lose that person's expertise and experience? It just doesn't make sense. If they know that they can come back after three months, six months, whatever it is, then yeah, why why wouldn't we be trying to make that happen? And and of course, you know, the the contradiction with the government is that it's you know it's falling over itself to kind of to get come on come on down. All those people who took early retirement, can you actually come back into the workforce because we've got a massive labour shortage? But well, those are people in their 50s. Those are, you know, those are women, lots, you know, menopausal women who felt, who now, who then felt that they actually, that was their option. That was their only option. So, yeah, I'm fully, I'm fully supportive. <laughs> so a question about kind of the innovation, because we all laughed about the purple magnet, but you mentioned a couple of cases about the products that people can buy um, to kind of help alleviate some of the symptoms. So tell us a little bit more about that. And particularly, I think, in terms of how important it is for women to be involved in identifying what's needed and developing those products. And then perhaps a little bit about, you know, how people know what's available, because that's almost a separate issue. There was, I think that there was a workshop here, wasn't there, a few months ago, which was actually a company that's developing wearables. Were you, I don't know whether yeah. you felt, well, you might want to say something about that. I just saw a little fly and I thought that sounds really interesting. I think that the, for me, one of the issues about <clears throat> monetizing menopause is, as I showed with, you know, things like Pantene or Clarins, or in fact, you know, Boots are actually, they've just got a huge kind of banner um, display the, at their main, uh, one of their main kind of branches, which is all about the Boots's, you know, menopausal range. Now, I, if you looked at the, I haven't done this, if you looked at the ingredients of menopausal moisturiser and bog standard moisturiser, I would imagine that they are pretty much the same. So I think that, that there are things which will help uh, menopausal women, women, but at the moment, there's just, there's just like no evidence. There's no evidence that, you know, Pantene's, you know, new, men, you know, is their new product being tried and tested on menopausal women. And suddenly, you know, you've gone from really kind of boring, lank hair to this kind of full curly set. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it, it defies logic. That, that's what I would say. Um, so I think that there are things which are helpful. I think that the, the point that you're asking, uh, one of the kind of points is about how women know about these things. And again, I, I have no idea. I didn't know about half these things. Certainly didn't know, I'm not gonna keep talking about the, the, 
the, the pebble magnet. But I didn't know about that. I didn't know about ice pillows. I didn't know about sage tablets. I didn't know about any of those things. And if I had known about them, maybe I would have, well, I didn't have, you know, I didn't really have too much in the way of symptoms. So I'd probably, but I would certainly have told my twin about those things. Um, so I think, I think that what people, what menopausal women are thinking in terms of what's going to help is HRT. HRT is everywhere. You know, you had an HRT czar. So I think that trying to provide information about other things, and I think that's one of the great things about digital technology is that you can Google, you know, menopause symptoms or what helps menopause, and you will just get loads of information. But it's undifferentiated. You know, it's a bit like, you know, looking for menopausal information on TikTok. You know, you can get, apparently all my students are now, they're not using for menopause, but, you know, the TikTok is the where they go for news. Goodness help us. Anyway, um, so I think that, you know, the, so the problem with actually looking for information is that how do you differentiate between, you know, the, the things which are real and could legitimately help you and the things which are like, <laughs> Absolutely. It's that kind yeah. of, um, you know, also you need something that's available for everybody, but also how do you personalize it to you? Because one thing that came through was about that shared experience, but also how personal it yeah. was. Um, and I think that's what's exciting in terms of, you know, what's coming in terms of technology and artificial intelligence and so on and personalized approaches, which are going to help women to really understand, you know, what's out there, but how they have what's right for them at any one point in time. Well, I think what, what's interesting, there was, it was on the news today, I don't know whether anyone else heard about it, this new, it's described as a gadget, which is a really a, 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 a appalling term, it's a device to, to help uh, people who've got Tourette's. And so it's basically kind of wristwatch type thing, they were, you know, someone who suffers from Tourette's wears it for 10 minutes, and it tries to regulate or can it, it stops the frequency of ticks. Now, if we can actually think of something, you know, if someone you know, could develop some kind of technology, a wearable technology, which encourages or kind of shows where women's hormones are or yeah, I don't know. I don't know how, how it works, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility. The fact that we don't have that, the fact that, that women have, you know, go through the menopause since, you know, time began and we still don't know hardly anything about it says something about people's interests you know researchers interests so you know the more that we can make a bit of a fuss plus there's a kind of really obvious bottom line concern here we're talking about 50 percent of the population all of whom would would try anything you know when you're in the throes you know when you're there and you're you, you know you're you're red in the face and you're sweating and you're you're just thinking I just want to die, or I need to open a window, or I just need to go to need. I need to go and lie down. The point about this is a very personal situation. If there's if there's some if there's a remedy that you could go to that would is not kind of break the bank, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you try these things? Mm -hmm. But we don't know about them. It's the problem. Absolutely. So that that point of access is really important. Are there any questions? Yeah, people have had time. Question over here. So you know when you're talking about the menopausal symptoms and how you are like if you're in the workplace and you get a lot of negativity or people making jokes, what's the best way to handle that sort of for women moving forward? Is it best to like you're talking about a lecturer to sort of stand up and acknowledge it? Or because I think at the minute women are quite reluctant to say, Oh, this is what I'm experiencing. So I'm just curious what you thought about that. I think that the the issue there is about cultural change because I think it, it's pretty much it would be almost impossible even for a really confident woman to stand up you know or to be in a meeting and just say straightforwardly you know what I've just lost my train of thought just give me a moment you have to you that that culture has to exist and I think it doesn't exist in most workplaces. So I think it's actually really difficult for one woman to do that. The, I mean, one, not in necessarily in the, in the context of menopause, but what the, the strategies that do work is that women in a meeting will actually get together before the meeting and actually say, okay, let's support each other. I'm going, I'm going to suggest X. If do you, you know, do you agree? Yes. Well, can you back me up in that meeting? So in that situation, I think that get get other women, you know, allies or even men who are going to be supportive so that you can actually make that point 
in that meeting for the first time and you're going to get a sympathetic reading but the the key you know the larger issue is about creating an environment where it's actually okay to say that and that environment is created by the management of that organization or the man you know the you know the the senior team in your department or your faculty or your organization that's that's where we need to put our energies is actually to try and encourage managers and you know the management to actually take this seriously and actually enable a culture where women can say that or you know so you have a room that you can go and have a lie down or that you don't you know no one's going to make some you know arsy comment when you say can I have a fan you know, or any of those, those things it's about cultural change and that's we are that's where we are now I think any other questions over here It did ask me a question and I thought, I haven't a clue what's going on here. So, and one of the youngsters said, oh, I agree with Margaret. I was just answered in. I said, do you? And I was like, ah. You know, but it's great. I'm not sure that the leave is a good thing because women are all different. But I think something you did, maybe you did mention, I don't know, but it's mental health because you don't know. Somebody said to me, oh, you go do lolly when you get the menopause. And I thought, is that right? And it's sometimes I did. I was kind of seeing things and everything is, and I, I lost a lot of weight. And I remember in one of my other part-time student jobs, somebody said, oh, you're lovely. Because she was quite big. She says, you've lost a lot of weight, Margaret. I'm like, I can't eat. What's she talking about? And it, at that point, I remember thinking, because you're thin doesn't mean to say you're well. But I had a feeling that it would pass. But um, So it's so complex. But I think it's great that it's been addressed. Because even things like, you know, young, it's ageism at both ends. You know, women are not getting smears or, you know. So it's, I think it's fantastic that it's, that it's been mentioned. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Two in the middle. <laughs> I just want to ask a question just about um, research studies, because I was at the lecture this morning about dementia, where they took 13,500 people to do a study of over 65s. Um, and uh, I just want to, you know, when you there's been talk about how every woman's experience is different, and I just wanted to get your sense of what research studies comprehensive ones have been done in terms of the menopause, in terms of what works, what doesn't, women's experiences, why they're different, is there a genetic component, whatever. Um, and if there, have, if there aren't studies with thousands and thousands of women, why not? Do you want to ask your question as well? And perhaps um, yes, that. thank yeah. you. Um, great. Yeah, I've chimed a lot with, um, with me. Um, I just wonder how we get the other half of the population on board with this, because it's it's a bit like periods, it's a bit like all of any women's health. How do we get men on board with it? Mm -hmm. You know, because they're part of the solution. Absolutely. So and I, I mean, just to answer your, the, your question first, and then the, the, the research question, I think this is why, I mean, if I just think about what we're doing at, at the university, we have a the head of well-being is is a is a man. He has been like one hundred and ten percent. He's kind of supported the the, uh, the 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 play. So I think that it's. I mean, one of the ways I, I I guess to try and encourage men and particularly male managers into you know into the conversation is to get them to hear women. If you see what I mean. So I think that. You know, I have no idea how many people, you know, or, or the kind of gender breakdown of the of this morning's lecture because I wasn't here. But I suspect that it probably was a more even gender split than than what we're seeing today, and that that tends to be the case every time I've actually talked about this uh, in, in any kind of forum. So I think that we that I mean part of it is because you know the 
there, there could be kind of embarrassment about kind of talking about that, uh, you know, again, amongst men and in fact uh, um, amongst women. But it just seems to me that if we actually put it as part of the well-being agenda, as opposed to something which is, you know, about a woman's problem, because actually it's everyone's it's everyone's issue because every woman who's going through the menopause is likely to have friends you know co-workers managers if they're working you know other people in their lives and they're all affected by us when we're going to go when we're going through the menopause so the more that we can actually i don't want to use the word educate but raise awareness about around menopause then actually i think that that is a way to try and encourage you know men into the conversation but they have to want to be encouraged so and that, that yeah that's another different piece of work but to, 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 to turn to your question about research I think there have been many more studies on prostate cancer than there have been on menopause um, I have no idea the the number of studies which are more comprehensive in terms of menopause um, experiences or symptoms um, I suspect that there there aren't that many I haven't written about this um, as yet, because this is my kind of first foray into this area. This is not my kind of research area. Um, but yes, further in, further into it, I'm sure that I will find that there are uh, there's a paucity of research which actually does look in a more comprehensive way at women's experiences. And I would I would encourage you to kind of get in touch with the organisers or get in touch with us because we run a number of networks for women. Uh, looking at women's health and looking at innovation in women's health. And so if, if that's a con part of the conversation you'd like to know more about and continue, do get in touch. We've got to, that time for one question. We've got some online people. So a, a question from online. Regarding protected characteristics, would it help if the character characteristic was broader with reference to gynecological conditions or symptoms to include things like endometriosis, menopause and others? I'm I'm in two minds as to as to the extent to which menopause should be seen as a protected characteristic because for precisely the reason that we've just discussed, which is it's really personal, it's a hugely diverse kind of area. I think even if it was made a protected characteristic, sex is a protected characteristic. That does not stop employers discriminating against, you know, against women. Age is a protected characteristic. You know, race and ethnicity are protected characteristics. They, they having a protected the, the label of protected characteristic does not guarantee that you're going to be protected. Um, so I think that I think that again, it would be if we were going to go down that line, it would be in the in the fine print. What would it mean to say that menopause was a protected characteristic? In principle, it would mean that you couldn't discriminate against a woman who was actually menopausal. But as I said. In a you know in in other work in other contexts, issues around age. You know, older women are discriminated against every which way. You're just not going to say that that's that's what the problem is. So so I think that you'd have to if you were going to go that way. I mean, I'm not sure whether or not it would it would help to ha to have it as a more inclusive women's health issue, which I think is what the the the, the online person is talking talking about. Um, I think that with all these things, it's it's in the fine print because there are, you know, as, as much as you have a, le a legislative responsibility, there are all sorts of ways in which, you know, if you're minded to, you can get around that. Well, I mean, brilliant, Karen. And I have to say thank you for an absolutely fascinating talk today. I think we all agree it's the start of the conversation. Recently, the population in the world hit 8 billion, 4.5 are women. And so we've got a huge agenda here in terms of understanding both menopause, but women, ageism, it's all interlinked. And so I hope you've really enjoyed today. Thank you for joining in person and for those online. And if at any point you've had something that's really tweaked your imagination and you'd like to get more involved, contact either the organizers today, contact me through voice or Karen, and we will be delighted to um, involve you in research and or innovation on this hugely important topic. So massive thanks to Karen and please say your appreciation. Thank you.